uh, welcome to our webinar today, Building Your Cultural Orientation Programs for Increased Arrivals. My name is Menar Marouf, and I'm the Senior Training Coordinator with CORE. And today I am being joined with, by my colleague, Ella Fowler, our Research and Learning Officer, and she's saying hi to everyone. Uh, she will be uh, helping a lot with producing for today's uh, session. So thank you, thank you so much, Ella. We are uh, going to be joined uh, as well uh, with by our uh, colleague uh, Jamie Bussey, who's the deputy director of CORE, and she will chime in. So and you will see her uh, typing in the chat from time to time. So thank you, Jamie, as well. Before uh, we start talking about the session's objectives, I would like to share with you about the reasons and uh, the objectives uh, for why we uh, prepared for this session. So we started preparing for this webinar in July, in early July, and our goal was to provide support and resources for cultural orientation providers, uh, building their cultural orientation programs specifically after years of reduced numbers. And with everything that's been happening recently, recently with the evacuations in um, Afghanistan, I'm pretty sure that many of you have witnessed or like have been receiving um, uh, increased arrival numbers. So I think that this webinar couldn't have come at a more appropriate time because while building our cultural orientation programs that way, we will be able to support more clients in, in better ways. So uh, moving to the session's objectives, we are going to start with an assessment. So what you are going to do is you're going to assess your current cultural orientation program. And we have an activity for that. After that, we will hear from uh, colleagues uh, from, RS, from overseas and domestic CO uh, about their cultural orientation programs and how they're preparing for increased arrivals or increased departures. Uh, and that way you will be able to identify best practices. After that, we will uh, go through some of the main uh, core resources that you uh, will uh, hopefully find helpful in the process. And after that, towards the end, you are going to create a localized action plan to build CO program capacity. And we will do this together. So um, welcome. And I am very much looking forward for this webinar uh, with you today. OK. Before we start our session, we will do some housekeeping. So first, this webinar is being recorded. And also that recording and resources will be shared after the session. So everything we share today will be shared after the session. In the middle of the session, we will take a five minute break and we uh, will greatly appreciate your participation because like I said, the webinar today is very interactive. There will be a lot of activities to do. So it would be very important to have your participation in the session. Some of the other features that we're going to use are the raise hand. And in order to find the raise hand, you would uh, need to check the bottom of your screen and you will find the toolbar and you'll find the raise hand icon there. The other feature we are going to use is going to be the chat feature. And with this feature, you will be able to share uh, your opinions, your thoughts. You'll, you'll answer some of the questions that we will have for you. So I highly encourage you to take advantage of this feature today. The following feature we're going to use is the question and answer. And like I said earlier, we're going to have colleagues from overseas and domestic CO that will, CO programs that will uh, present to us about uh, best practices in uh, delivering cultural orientation. So uh, I highly encourage you to add your questions in the question and answer section. A new feature we are going to use today is uh, closed captioning or uh, subtitles. And the reason we wanted to use that is to allow for anybody who is unable to hear us today to be able to follow along the webinar through subtitles. I just activated that. And now if you go to the icon about that says live 
transcript, you will see the show subtitles icon and you will need to click on it if you wish to see the subtitles. Just to let you know, though, that some of um, some of the words are not transcribed correctly and you will see now, for instance, when we say cultural orientation or like CEO, it will uh, sometimes be transcribed as SEO. And uh, the word polls will be transcribed as poll or um, poll, Paul. So in order, if you find this um, not favor, not, not good for you, you can deactivate this feature uh, by clicking on the same icon and, and deactivate it. Great. Speaking of polls, uh, today we have multiple polls that we are going to use, and we are now starting with the first poll. Like I said, uh, we are experiencing increased arrivals, uh, increased, uh, you know, sudden, sudden uh, uh, movement of um, refugee, uh, like, uh, refugee arrivals, I'm sorry. Uh, so it, this can be a lot and this can cause a multi multitude of feelings. So for, for the purpose of today's webinar, please uh, answer this question. How do you feel about increased arrivals in CO? And you have excited, confident, nervous, overwhelmed or other. And for other, please share in the chat if you're experiencing a different feeling. We'll give you another 15 seconds to complete the poll. Jacqueline is saying all of the above, yes. Okay, we still have a few more answers trickling in, so we'll leave it open for a few more seconds. About 72% of you have participated. If you are struggling in participating, please go ahead and use the chat if you would like to share an answer. The poll is now closed and I'm sharing results. Thank you so much, Ella. Uh, you will see uh, there is a range of emotions. I'm so glad to see that excited is uh, the top feeling. And it is normal to feel, like I said, a range of emotions or feel a mixture of those feelings. Uh, we feel excited because finally, after years of backlog, uh, refugees are able to, uh, to go to where they want to go. We also feel confident that we will be able to provide the quality services that we want to, to provide to clients in order to achieve their long-term goals. We can also feel nervous. This is not, um, the, things are changing all the time. We don't know if our offices are going to be able to cope with this change. Uh, are we going to be able to provide the, the services we want to, to provide? And do we have the, the resources needed? So it is pretty normal. And we, of course, it is also very normal to fear overwhelmed. Like I said, it's been, um, the, it's, the, the last few weeks have been a lot for a lot of us. So like, feelings, we, the reason why we wanted to start with feelings today is because uh, we wanted to identify uh, where we are, not just programmatically, but also as staff, where how we feel about what's going on and if we are if we are ready or not. So Ella just shared the feelings wheel in the chat, and uh, this tool will be helpful for you to lose outside of this uh, of the out of the. Sorry, outside of this webinar to uh, identify feelings uh, regarding work or otherwise. And they are, this wheel is a really good starting point to, to, to start from. The second question we have is what are your main concerns about delivering CO over the next year? We have multiple options. Please choose one or more. Or if the options mentioned are not. Uh, like relevant to you, please feel free to share in the chat.
Okay, a few more seconds. All right, the poll has now ended. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ella, and thanks to those of you who participated. We see that lack of trained interpreters is the top concern, followed by not enough CO providers, and then followed by not enough trained CO providers. Yeah, it is. These are real concerns, and uh, I want you to hold on to that thought together with the feelings question, because we're going to go back to those feelings afterwards. Okay, so now after we identified uh, our feelings uh, and concerns, a good starting point will be to look at your current CO program, co programs in terms of capacity, resources, etc., and see where you stand. Ella is going to uh, share a uh, a document, a worksheet in the chat, and I uh, also mentioned, I also shared it with you in an email before this session uh, to download because um, in case you have some issues downloading, you will be able to go to your email and uh, open the, the worksheet on your device. Does everybody have, have access to this worksheet? Please share in the chat before we move on. Great, I see, I see that we have yeses in the chat. Um, for those of you who don't have it and were not able to open it, we are going to uh, have to have m the items of that uh, worksheet in our slides, so you will be able to follow along. So if you don't have it, please have a piece of paper and a pen so that you can follow along with us. Okay. Okay, so like I said, we're going to spend the next 10 minutes working on the worksheet and the worksheet that you have is made up of two parts. Today we are, and now we are going to focus on part one, which is the rapid cultural orientation program ass assessment. So after you download it on your device, uh, like I said, we are going to review the first part and then at the end, we will tally or you will tally your results. So like I, like I said, this tool is a quick tool. It's not meant to be a deep dive into uh, assessing your cultural orientation pro program, but it is meant to uh, help you identify your current CO program capacity, both of staff and resources and action steps to build and improve on your CO program. So what I want you to do for the next minute or so, could you please fill out the basic information section that you see on the screen? And you will see we have the resettlement agency, office, city, title of person in charge of CO programming, current staff and volunteers involved in CO delivery, estimated arrivals for PY21, and PY we mean fiscal year, and anticipated arrivals for PY22. And when done, please let us know in the chat by typing done. Soraya, they are on the first part uh, of the worksheet that you have, and they are under the section that says rapid cultural orientation assessment. It's a table that has the space to fill out basic information. OK. 
Okay, we're gonna take a few more moments to allow more time for people to participate. Just a reminder that I sent an email before the webinar titled Worksheet for Core Webinar. And like Jamie mentioned, if you don't see the worksheet, you can write your answers on a piece of paper. And we will be sure to share this document again in our follow-up email. Okay, moving on. The next section we are going to review is the, the actual assessment. But before we start with that, we are going to have uh, to go through some definitions, which are the three areas, the three main areas that we are going to uh, review and assess today for implementing cultural orientation programs. They are planning and administration, curriculum, and staff training. And they are, uh, we are calling them PACs. So please take a moment to review. And in the meantime, I'm just going to review the defini definitions for those of you who are unable to uh, view the document. So planning and administration, what with that, we mean looking at your current CO caseload, how many sessions you do, the languages uh, the language needs, how many languages do you need CO in, and available staff and interpreters for delivery of all CO sessions required to cover topics as outlined by the CO objectives and indicators, as well as conducting assessments. And when what we mean by CO objectives and indicators are, uh, it's a document that you will find uh, hyperlinked on the worksheet, but you can also find it on our website, and we will also refer to it later on in the session. And that document includes the main topics required uh, by cultural orientation providers to cover in cultural orientation. Okay, the second area we are going to focus on is curriculum. And what I mean by that is um, what curriculum you have, whether you implement interactive activities or not, and do you cover all the required topics as outlines in the CO objectives and indicators. The last area where, where you are going to assess is staff training. And in this section, you will look at the CO provider training that you have in your program, in your office, including needs to both for both staff and volunteers, because you know that staff, staff training is critical for ensuring consistent messaging across all core service delivery during reception and placement period. Are we ready all to right. go to the next slide? Yes, please. Okay. so. As you see in front of you, the next step is to start with assessing planning and implementation. And you have multiple um, steps or multiple items that you would read. And we're gonna do an example shortly. And then if the statement is correct and reflects what you actually do in your program, you would put yes. If not, you would put no. If it's partially yes, but you have some questions or like some things are not 100% the way you want them to be, you can add a comment, like a comment in the comments section. So for instance, looking at the first one, when we, when we, if you have enough CO providers to deliver effective CO that covers all required topics while managing, uh, while but at the same time, you are unable to manage your workload and balance other roles and responsibilities. So you would put a partial yes and um, and then you would add a, a comment because you do not you know this statement does not uh, like ap apply to you 100% so 
For here, we are going to take three minutes to allow time for you to review those statements. And like I said, for those of you who are unable to view these statements, you can see them on the screen now and take note and add yes or no or comments so that you can follow along with us. When finished, please put done in the chat. We will take a few more seconds to allow more time for others to participate before moving to the next section. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great, thank you so much for participating. Um, the next section that we are going to assess now is the curriculum. So you're going to do the same thing. You are going to look at these statements and see if they apply to your program. And if they, they do partially and you would like to make some comments for you to remember later on, please do so. And we will take three minutes or less to finish this section. And again, please let us know when done, type done in the chat.
Okay, we're gonna wait for a few more seconds. All right. The following section that we are going to do now is the staff training. So now you are going to assess your staff training, doing the same, following the same steps. You're going to read the statement and look at if if look if it applies to your if it applies to your program, and put yes. If not, you would put no. And then on the worksheet, there's space for the comments section. We will also take two to three minutes to finish that. All right, a few more seconds. Great, thank you. And if you're not able to finish that now, like, I, like we said, this worksheet is for you and we will actually share the resource again in the follow-up email to you so that you will be able to review on your own. Okay, now what do we do with, with all of these yes and no's? Um, our goal is to help you figure out where you are, like, like I said earlier, in your program capacity. So now that you have all of your answers in front of you, please count each yes as one point each partial yes, which means a yes and a comment, as half a point, and tally your results. And take a moment. We are going to take a minute to allow for everyone to do so. And if you feel comfortable, please feel free to share your results in the chat. Congratulations, Nisreen, 12 out of 12. But don't leave us yet. There is a lot more coming that I'm sure you'll benefit from. Logan, 
but you are doing really great. We have a lot of A pluses today. That's awesome. Great. Nine from Katya. <laughs> 10 from Luda. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your scores. Um, we really appreciate that. But in the, uh, for the purpose of this uh, webinar, uh, we are going to move on. But thank you. And that sounds really great that you are all doing great in your programs. OK, so doing this activity, which of the following PACS areas do you think needs the most work? And when, I, when we say that, it's for you and for your program, according to the activity that you just did, planning and administration, curriculum, or staff and volunteer training. And remember, we call them PACs. We're gonna take a few more seconds to allow for more participation. We have 56% of people participating, so we'll leave it open for 10 more seconds. The poll has now closed and I'm sharing the results. Thank you so much, Ella. We see that staff and volunteer training is an area that you thought needs most work for your program, followed by planning and administration and then curriculum. Well. Just to hold that thought, we are going to revisit these areas in, our, in the second part of our presentation. So stay tuned. But for the meantime, we have colleagues, like I said, we have our colleagues, Abby Joe Crobot, Kay, Kaylee Donovan from Refugee, uh, from GFCS, JFCS, Refugee and Immigrant Services. They're caseworkers and they are going to share with us their approach to the whole office approach, to the whole office service approach that they do. And then after that, we are going to hear from Evelyn Calderon, Senior Project Assistant for Compliance and Cultural Orientation from IRC Latin America. Both Abby Joe and Kay Kaylee will present to us for five minutes, and then Evelyn will pr present to us for another five minutes. And please, as you are listening to the presentations, if you have any questions, add them in the question and answer section. And over to you, Abby Joe and Kaylee. Hello. So my name is Abby Jo. And I'm Kaylee. Um, and we've utilized um, whole agency approach to CO um, to mean whole service approach to CO. So in order to really maximize our efficiency with both time, um, but to incorporate adult learning principles um, and to really stretch the efficiency that we have for our staff um, and make sure that clients are having information reviewed um, in a very real sense for them. Um, cultural orientation happens throughout the entire continuum of RNP core services. And so staff, interns, volunteers, and AmeriCorps members participate consistently um, to teach and review CO topics. And obviously to utilize this, having everyone involved in um, facilitating CO, it requires a high level of training for everyone involved. 
Um, so we don't want to reinvent the wheel or take more of our time and training. So we really utilize the resources available from core. So the first step for anyone who's going to be a CO facilitator is to complete core CO provider onboarding course, which is available on their website because it just gives them a really good, um, background in the refugee um, resettlement process, in cultural orientation, and in adult learning principles. The next step is to have them shadow a CO session with an experienced provider to see how it goes, how to troubleshoot, how to engage um, their clients. And then we follow that with allowing them to review the CO topics, presentations, um, activities, um, and other resources that we have to get familiar with them and ask any questions. Um, and then they would provide CO with um, supervision from one of us and then continue to educate themselves by attending webinars and participating in certificate courses. Um, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> As part of our sort of whole service approach, we've looked at all of the topics and figured out which topics um, are best delivered in different ways to maximize understanding from clients. And we found that for a lot of topics, it's most effective um, to give them something tangible to attach it to. And so for some of the topics, it's completely hands-on, something like a bus training, uh, where they're learning about their new community and about the transportation just by traveling around, feeling how they go, the, go on the bus, seeing all the places that they're supposed to see. Other topics, we find it's better to integrate them with core services to give them that tangible aspect. So we would, um, for the school enrollment, go over the school system before we had a scheduled enrollment meeting. Um, and then after that meeting where they talked with, uh, you know, the school counselors, maybe seen the school building, then that would be a good time to transition into talking about what to expect and how to support their kids in school. So it's connecting it to something tangible that they can see. Um, and then um, there are a few topics that because of their seriousness or importance, we found it's better to pull out, have them be standalone, um, more sort of traditional cultural orientation seminar sessions. Um, so, of course, as, as many of you know, uh, U.S. laws and refugee status are some pretty critical topics um, that can come with very um, intense consequences if clients don't understand them thoroughly. And so uh, we have a PowerPoint that's generated by our Volag Hayes um, that we've enhanced uh, to be very specific to our community um, and our, our city of Pittsburgh. Um, and so we make sure that um, the PowerPoint um, is upgraded sort of frequently and is stays relevant. Um, so for example, with COVID, uh, we've made sure that it's very Zoom friendly. Um, and with the recent uptick in news coverage for police brutality, um, we've incorporated CORE's translated video resource um, in all of the languages that, that we use it for, or we prepare our interpreters to, to uh, give a um, synopsis of the video or pause throughout it. Um, in order to really convey things quickly, um, efficiently, and to not rework the wheel, um, so to speak. Um, and we also incorporate um, photos of the way that police in Pittsburgh are. So cops with um, different types of dogs on horses, motorcycles, all the different vehicles that um, people may see, as well as the specific documents that um, Pennsylvania residents would have to have or, or would use. Especially with some of these sort of more classroom sessions, we recognize that they're sort of tough, um, difficult and uncomfortable topics for clients to cover. So there are some strategies that we've implemented to make it sort of a, a more open and welcoming environment. Um, so generally for topics like US laws, we try and make sure that we're having separate sessions for men and women so that everyone feels comfortable um, raising their questions and participating in discussion. And we do attempt whenever possible to have um, an interpreter of the same gender for those sessions. We've also found that, you know, we want it to be welcoming. We want people to feel comfortable there, which they often don't if it's just a straight up class. And so we always try and at the beginning have a little time for people to come in to talk with each other. Um, we provide tea and snacks for families to make it just feel a little bit more welcoming and make them feel comfortable as we prepare to talk about difficult topics. Um, and then because everyone is, um, 
because caseworkers and staff members are involved in giving CO, um, we're able to pivot and adapt cultural orientation intensity as needed for the clients. Uh, so we're able to adjust for pre-literate pre -literate clients or pull back in intensity uh, for clients who might be very familiar with American culture or processes. Um, and that is all we have. Thank you very much, Abby, Joe, and Kaylee for your presentation. We learned a lot from you today. And following that, we have Evelyn. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, and it's over to you now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Evelyn, and I'm going to talk about how RSE Latin America is preparing for the increase in departures. Next, please. So for you to know, our RSCLA structure is currently transitioning to this slide that you can see. We have a CEO leader, a senior project assistant. We have two facilitators in El Salvador and one per country in the rest of the countries. We cover five countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Costa Rica, eh, Honduras, and Ecuador. We have created three modalities, the virtual, the telephonic, and the in-person. This one, uh, the in-person is currently on hold uh, until further notice due to the pandemic. Uh, to increase the departures, we have moved from one CO per week to two CO uh, virtual sessions per week and up to six telephonic CO uh, per week. We always, after every CO virtual session, we always make sure to um, share with the applicants the experience survey to uh, identify if there is something that we can improve and how they feel with the information they receive. Currently, our program is based on the core curriculum uh, for the overseas. We uh, touch 11 topics and we try to comply with 78 indicators. Next, please. So the key actions that RSC LA has implemented, well, first, we have been able to separate the CO pillar uh, from the compliance pillar. Now we have half of the staff exclusively dedicated to cultural orientation. We have added more facilitators where the departures are expected to be higher. That example is what we have done in El Salvador. We have added two because we know that we are going to have more departures in that country and we are still assessing if another country will need this too. Uh, we have created a nesting training that actually is based on the onboarding training for CO facilitators that is available on core. Uh, we have been able to adapt that to our needs. Uh, and during those two to three weeks, the staff is shadowing every aspect of the CO process in a region. We are preparing to create the youth CO uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, because the Central American Miners Program, it's going to be reopened and it's moving uh, towards the phases. So we need to be ready with that specific population. And we have documented all of our processes and make sure that we revise our standard operating procedures quarterly. Next, please. So what we've been able to achieve with all these changes is that we have adapted the CO indicators uh, to the remote modalities. We have found better ways to make these remote modalities more user-friendly. An example of that is that we have created a pre-session for refugees to get familiar with the SOUP platform before they receive their CO session. Another thing is that we have added active breaks on our session to avoid cognitive overload. We have been able to have an efficient delivery of cultural orientation during COVID-19, uh, moving from the in-person modality to the remote person modality. We have been able to have active collaboration with UNAM, our CO team. We have met not only our program expectations, but our user expectations. We have noticed that refugee experience le less anxiety uh, before departure when they have received the remote CO sessions. Um, and we have been able to accomplish user engagement on remote sessions. An example of that is that uh, we use this pre-session for them to get familiar with the platform. We ask them to read out loud what they see on their screens. Uh, we ask them direct questions and we use a lot the adult learning principle. An example of that is that we always ask our refugees on the session uh, to provide their own experiences. Uh, for example, when we are trying to establish similarities and differences 
from their uh, countries of origin and what they would expect on their resettlement country uh, regarding the CO topics. Next, please. So my recommendation specific moment would be, well, number one, uh, to perform after action reviews or debriefs with your team members. That has been a practice that helped us a lot on our region to identify best practices, uh, lessons learned, and to provide internal feedback within the team. Number two, document your processes, revise your SOPs quarterly or your manuals. This is key during a moment of change and adaptation like this increasing programs. Uh, so that would be very handful to have for your staff to understand the uh, current processes that these documents are available for them. Number three, use data as your best friend for decision making. An example of that is that as we expect to have higher departures in El Salvador, we uh, decided to have more facilitators in that country. And then four, residency towards change. Um, I would never get tired to say, trust your team, trust your knowledge, and very, very important, please try to use all the resources that CORE has available in their platform. An example of that is that we have been using that uh, for a region adapted to, work, to our needs and we have great results. So that would be all for my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Uh, we really appreciate your participation with us today. Uh, I see some questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So um, my first, the first question was for Abby, Joe, and Kaylee about practicing transportation training during um, online. So that's from Soraya. And she's asking, while we are doing CO online, how to practice the transportation training? Um, so we have found that we can't do transportation training without doing it in person. And so what we've done is that we've eliminated an in-person interpreter. So we use interpreters over the phone to remove one person from um, from play. Um, and we have reduced the bus training to only the necessities. So getting downtown, uh, getting home, and then getting to um, the uh, a local grocery store. We also try to um, sort of outsource it if possible by asking a community member or a neighbor or a US tie who's already interacting with the clients um, to, to teach them. But typically we just we just have to do it with the clients because it doesn't work uh, for self-sufficiency and, and employment otherwise. Um, but we do try to mitigate um, and, and we make sure that masks uh, and vaccinated status are as likely as possible. Um, and for our experience, we've, we, have a, uh, we haven't had too many problems with masking or, or getting vaccinated. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the other question I believe, <clears throat> sorry, is for Evelyn. Do you have an example of that pre-CO curriculum? How do you identify the topics to include to prepare clients for CO? Well, oh, sorry, I'm going to turn on my camera. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, actually, what we cover on the pre-session, it's for them to get familiar just with the Zoom platform. Uh, we establish like common rules, like confidentiality to find a safe place, that this would be uh, a place for them to uh, express what they need when we're covering certain topics. Uh, but a practice that actually has helped us a lot when talking about employment, because um, we were able to uh, adapt the three-day curriculum to a four-hour curriculum in the virtual CO. Um, obviously, we're not able to do as many activities as, as we would wish, but something that helped us and that we are doing in the pre-session is we ask them about what are the topics they are interested to learn so we can prepare for the next day to emphasize on the topics that they have identified on that pre-session. That would be number one. And number two, uh, another example that I have is that for the employment topic, uh, as is very extend, uh, extends, uh, we decided to add a homework that we share with them on the pre-session uh, where we uh, 
show them some questions for them to think in the rest of the day. So we would discuss, discuss those, those responses the next day on the CEO session when we discuss about the employment topic. So that would depend on you to do a pre-assessment on the pre-session uh, to see what is more needed for your client on the session. Thank you, Evelyn, for your uh, answer. Uh, we have a question from Karen. Karen is saying, we do not have public transportation in our city. Any any thoughts or resources to use? Anyone would like to, to chime in? Um, I guess I would uh, focus for transportation CO on the transportation laws um, and how people get around. So um, I'm a city girl, so I would have no idea what to do. So I would I would probably ask everyone like how, how do you get around? Um, and so you know when I moved to Michigan, for example, I had no idea that the DMV wasn't called the DMV and I was completely lost by the new system. And so um, if you just sort of try to think about it as moving to a new city or, or moving the opposite, um, I, I think that that would be the best way to go about it. Um, or maybe talking to a refugee who's been here three to five years and ask them what they wish that they would have known. Um, that's sort of who Kaylee and I refer uh, lean on a lot is, is you know, we were caseworkers for um, other programs and so we're able to to pull on clients and be like hey do you wish we would have talked to you about this earlier um, and so we're able to incorporate um, some relationships and some sort of tidbits along the way that that refugees really become the the most um, helpful resource for for future refugees thank you so much abby joe I see uh, there's a question um, about in the question and answer about capacity in terms of staff. So um, the comment says, please keep in mind that not all agencies are this large and can have multiple FTEs, meaning full-time employees, to provide CO. We have less than one full-time staff for CO. It should help to hear from small agencies and how they manage with less resources. So I can, I just want to chime in. Um, I don't know the size of your specific agency, but I will say that we don't have any employees dedicated solely to CO. Um, CO is provided by the RNP caseworkers um, and by the match grant employment specialist and by a medical specialist who splits her time between three or four different programs. So that's why we find the whole service approach to be helpful because you don't need to have a separate employee meeting with people separate in time, separate times. You're incorporating it into when you are already meeting with the clients. You're incorporating the knowledge you already have of the clients into how to most effectively deliver CO. So um, if you aren't already utilizing interns, I would highly recommend doing that. Um, because they can help with a lot of the time consuming CO like transportation sessions or hygiene sessions. Um, and if you have sort of more long term volunteers, which we've had found more luck with on the employment type of CO, having them conduct some of those sessions. Um, but we have no one full time dedicated only to CO. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Sorry, just to sort of further that, we're also not dedicated to RNP exclusively. So we do RNP match grant and a few other different grants as well. Um, so we really have to be very, very efficient. So it sounds like we know what we're doing and it sounds like we're doing a lot of CO, but we're doing a lot of CO in a very small points throughout the entire 90 days. So we maximize the touch points, which allows us to cover a lot at small times which we found works a lot better because that's how the adult brain sort of works and clients prefer in our cases, um, we, we've worked with a lot of Congolese uh, who don't have a high level of literacy. They prefer to hear the small amounts of information over time um, because a lot of information just sort of goes in one ear and out the other because it can be very overwhelming to learn completely new systems all at once. Um, so that, that's just that. Thank you, Abby Joe. I see some comments in the chat. Um, Karen is saying 
that you guys use the police officer, fireman, lawyer, etc., community members help. I saw another comment about Logan saying that you are in the same situation and you use a similar approach to Kaylee's and everybody in the office takes a share. Sharing is caring, right? And uh, Bree also mentioned uh, you have each case manager run a topic or two. So there are ways to collaborate and using the resources that you have and maximizing these resources would be the best approach if you don't have staff uh, that are dedicated for cultural orientation. Okay, any, uh, I see just one last question. Uh, how would you all suggest organizing transportation to CEO sessions, workshops, any creative ideas? And that's from Bree. Anybody would like to quickly answer this question before we uh, take our break? Um, just quickly, that's going to depend, I guess, on if you're in a city or not. Um, so we do some things on Zoom, some things like, for example, we did a lease signing where it turned into a CEO about housing and US laws. Um, and so we did it outside because three or four families were resettled on the same block. We said, hey, are you guys cool if we use these picnic tables? And they were okay with it. And so we just sort of are flexible at every point. Um, and it, it does take a lot of uh, pliability with staff, um, but if you're able to be flexible, just sort of thinking outside the box and um, trying things and just sort of going with the flow as much as possible, which isn't a very concrete answer, uh, but that's that's sort of how we do it. We just, we just go with it when we can. Something I'll add to this um, that I've heard from, hi, this is Jamie, I'm the Deputy Director at CORE. Um, and pre-COVID, um, what we heard some organizations also did uh, is sort of identifying spaces that are more central to where um, clients might be located. Um, so creating partnerships with libraries or community centers, um, faith-based organizations that might have space that's more where they're located. So they're, you're not having, because uh, it really depends. Some uh, resettlement agency offices are like quite far from where clients are located. Um, and I know some people mentioned there's not, you know, public um, transportation. The other option is thinking back to that creative approach of the whole office approach or the all service approach and where you have those different CO touch points. So for example, um, you know, there's home visits that are required within the first 30 days, maybe not in the first 24 hour home visit. Are you going to really make any impasse with CO uh, uh, you know, key messages, but maybe close to that 30 days, that could be an opportunity to um, kind of put some CO messages or CO um, uh, sessions, you know, when you're at the individual's home. So there's lots of different creative ways to kind of think through when CO is happening and um, taking into consideration, you know, where they're located to, to have that happen. Um, and then one final point of clarity, I just wanted to add. Um, so Evelyn, who presented, is with a resettlement support center for Latin America. So this is um, this is the pre-departure overseas cultural orientation, um, which is um, you know you might have noticed she was talking about whole countries uh, that are delivering CO, and so um, they they do often have full-time um, kind of cultural orientation um, providers, which um, obviously is slightly a slightly different model than when you're working. Um, when you're receiving um, uh, refugees uh, here in the United States at your resettlement agency. And Evelyn, I see your hand. If you wanna add to that, please feel free to, to add to that. Yes, thank you for the, the clarifying comment, Jamie. Actually, I totally relate with uh, most of you mentioning that you do not have um, dedicated staff for CO. Actually, that's the reality for us right now, that structure is that one that we're going to transition. Uh, and I definitely uh, understand the importance of distributing uh, the tasks uh, among all the, the staff members of, of your units. So it's it not only happens for the RAs, it happens for the overseas um, uh, programs too, and we do the same as you. We distribute it as much as equally as we can. For example, the remote sessions, it's not performed by one facilitator. We always have two for troubleshooting, uh, and one provides half of the CO, the other provides the other half. So yes, that's a, a common reality within uh, uh, RAs and the programs too. Thanks. 
Thank you, Evelyn and Abby, Joe and Kaylee again. I hope that was helpful for everyone. We really appreciate your presence with us today and your presentation. Um, we are going to take a five minute break and we are going to set the timer. So please, after five minutes, please, uh, when you are back, type back in the chat and we will see you soon. Okay, welcome back everyone. Thank you for typing and letting us know that you're back in the chat. Now we are going to move on to our second part of the webinar, which is the action plan. Before we start working on the action plan, I just want to clarify that this part is on the worksheet that you have with you. And if you're still unable to download and open the worksheet, we, um, we are going to have the sections on the computer, on the slide, so you will be able to follow along with us. Like I said, the action plan, we are going to work on, on it for 15 minutes and we will work together and we will complete that part. And then for each section, it's, it will be reviewing the PACS areas. So we will start with planning and administration, and then to going to curriculum, and then going to staff training. And for each section, we are going to review some of the resources that you will need. But then afterwards, you are going to work on your own, and we will give you the time, a specific time for it to work on it. OK? Moving on. All right, so on your worksheet, and on the slide, you will see that this section involves working on the action plan. And that means we have identified action steps that are considered best practices through conversations with cultural orientation providers overseas and domestically that make cultural orientation programs strong. And for each action step, you will have a priority level. Is it going to be something that you will do immediately within a week or two after the session? Is it something you're going to do between one or two months? Or is it something longer term that requires a strategic change in your, in your program design that will take three to six months? But before we start working on that, we are going to share one resource, which is the activity banks. And Ella is going to help us go there. OK, so for the activity banks, you go to teach on our website and you click activity bank and you will have on the drop down menu the different topics that the activity banks um, have that we have. And Jamie just shared the file in the, in the chat as well. So if you go to cultural adjustment, and this will be very helpful now with the surge in Afghan clients, is that we will be able to implement some of these activities related to cultural adjustment and uh, resettlement. So for instance, as you can see in front of you, there is this activity, who is an American? for instance, you will find a definition of what that activity is. You will have instructions on the activity on how to do it. And as you can see, there's once you click on the plus sign, there's a drop down menu that will allow you to review the uh, activity. There is also a section on the materials needed for some of the activities you would need certain materials to implement. And there is a modifications and tips section. And that's very helpful for you because with now, now with COVID still being remote, different literacy levels, there are tips on how to modify your activities to fit where you are, how you're doing CO and the populations that you're working with. So as you can see there, each activity bank is compri comprised of multiple activities for you to use. OK, now going back to our worksheet, part two, the action plan. So the same way we did the first part of the activity in our in previously, we are doing we're going to do it again the same way. We are going to look at each section of 
packs or each area. And you will check on your document which action step that you need to do and what priority level this action step is. And there is also space for you to add things or activities or action steps that we did not identify in this worksheet. We are going to spend some time on that and we will take around four minutes and I'll set my timer. You have eight action steps to choose from. We're going to have a few more seconds to allow for more time to participate. And then we will move on to the next section. Please don't forget to type done in the chat when done. Great. Thank you to all of you who participated. Now we are going to move on to the next section, which you will also find in the worksheet. It is action steps or actions for curriculum. The same way for the first part, you will check and review each action step first and then check the priority level. But before we do that, there is one resource that we would like to share with you now that will be very helpful in this section, which is the core nav. And you can 
go there by going to corenav.org and you will find multiple the resources in multiple languages. So if you click on click on English, you will find on the left information for on the refugee uh, admissions program and on the right for cultural orientation. And just a quick note that this website is for refugees. You can share that with website with refugees and they can go on their own and review it. And as you can see here, you will ha have all the CO topics outlined. And then if you click on each topic, you will find resources in writing or you can listen as in audio or you can watch to you can watch the video a video and just a quick note that all these resources are the same they have the same information they are just in different media so that you the clients are able to access them without any difficulties okay now we have uh, four action steps to choose from please spend the next couple of minutes identifying which which action steps you need to take and then if there are other action steps that you would like to add you can add that at the bottom and do not forget to uh, check the priority level Please type down in the chat when done. We're going to have a few more seconds before we move on to the third section. And I see more people typing done in the chat. Wonderful. Let's move on to the next section then. Okay, the last section is the actions that you uh, may want to take for staff training. And for that, before we start working on it, there is one resource that we would like to share with you, which is the CO provider onboard, onboarding training or onboarding document. Same, you will find all the information you need on our website. Just if you go to the top and you click through the top, top down or like the, um, the items you will find what you're looking for so if you go to the onboarding the provider onboarding you will find multiple resources that will help you provide training and the resources for new providers so that they can do their job the right way And one of the most important resources that we would like to share with you is this one, which is the onboarding uh, checklist. It's made of, or it's comprised of four phases, and each phase will contain detailed steps on what you need to do in order to provide the new, to train the new provider, and that includes things like signing up for core resources, taking which, which courses to take at which step, when is it a good time to start allowing the new provider to teach, 
etc. So you will find all you need in that resource. Okay, now let's take two minutes to identify which action steps you would need to take for your own office. I'm going to time us as well. All right, I see some answers in the chat. Thank you very much for those of you who completed this section with us. Now moving on. We are going to have another question for you now, which uh, like I said in the beginning, we are going to revisit the feelings, the question, the feelings question that we had. So after listening to our panelists and after doing the rapid assessment and the activity, the, the uh, action steps, how do you feel about increase, increased arrivals now? We'll give you another 15 seconds to complete the poll. The poll has now closed. Thank you so much, Ella and the participants. I'm glad to see that the nervous and overwhelmed feelings are going down and that excited and confident feelings are going up. And I saw Angelique, yes, still nervous, but somewhat more confident. That is really not good to hear. Thank you so much. Okay, so that was the purpose of our webinar today to uh, so that you can feel more comfortable and more confident in the work that, that, in the, that you're able to provide work for during increased arrivals. And before you leave, we would really appreciate if you complete our post webinar survey that Ella is going to share in the chat now. It only takes a, a, like a minute. So please take time to fill this webinar, fill this post survey, web, post webinar survey, I'm sorry. And uh, give us your feedback. What did you think about the webinar? Uh, are there other things that you would like to see? Are there other trainings you would like us to provide? Please take a moment to do that. And for those who are finishing, filling out the survey, I would really like to thank you for joining us today. And we at CORE hope that this webinar was helpful for you.